Now that huge bear walked back behind my place. Hello and welcome to the West Hartford Board of Education Virtual Candidate Debate, sponsored by the League of Women Voters of Greater Hartford and West Hartford Community Interactive. I'm Libby Sweetek, a member of the Greater Hartford League, and I'm joined here tonight by Jennifer Evans and her staff from West Hartford Interactive. The League of Women Voters is a nonpartisan political organization which encourages informed and active participation by citizens in government. Tonight's candidate will fe uh, feature six. Um, Tonight's debate will feature six candidates, which I will introduce shortly. The League has provided timers for each candidate and a screener for questions submitted by the audience. The audience is encouraged to submit written questions via the Q&A tab on the bottom of your Zoom screen. They will be checked in order to avoid duplication and for appropriate content for this board seat. Questions may be submitted at any time. The debate will be conducted in a modified cumulative time format. Each candidate will have a total of approximately eight minutes of response and rebuttal time. Closing remarks will be held to two minutes. Our timers will alert each candidate as their allotted time expires. We are hoping to have a conversation tonight, so each candidate will have a chance to be the first uh, respondee for a question, and then we will open up the floor, so to speak, for other comments. Prior to airtime, a lottery was held to pick the responding order. So let me reintroduce the candidates. <clears throat> Going first will be Dr. Jason Chang, a Democrat. Going second, Ross Jacobs, running for the Connecticut party. Third will be Dr. Lorna Thomas Farquharson, also a Democrat. Fourth will be Deb Poulin, running as a Democrat. Fifth will be Claire Taylor Nezzarella, also a Democrat. And last but not least, Gail Harris, a Republican. Okay, if candidates are ready, we will start with the questions. So this first question goes to <clears throat> Dr. Jason Chang. What programming suggestions would you make to assist any students who have fallen behind in skill development due to remote learning and COVID-19 protocols in 2021? Thank you for the question. Uh, I want to start off by thanking the League of Women Voters and WHCI uh, for hosting us this evening and for continuing the, the, uh, the um, public conversation about uh, governing our schools and uh, and preparing for this election. Um, so yeah, the, this is a really important question uh, about, um, about learning disparities as a result of the COVID pandemic. And, uh, you know, there's a number of, of ways that we can address that and the ways that the district has already uh, begun to address this, um, mostly through, um, through attention to uh, social emotional learning, uh, as well as uh, increased numbers of uh, support staff and special staff that can help to identify further disparities between uh, students' experiences and their outcomes. Um, and I mentioned social emotional learning as an important dimension of this because we know that uh, that that when students uh, are struggling emotionally or when they are uh, they are experiencing stress and anxiety, they're not learning. And uh, and so these are important dimensions of the of of the curriculum that actually you know um, that actually improve uh, learning outcomes and can uh, can address those uh, those, those um, those disparities. Um, after school programs are an important dimension, uh, as well as you know, providing uh, parents with the skills and the, the resources to continue learning at home. Uh, school is, uh, is most effective when, uh, when parents and families are involved in the learning. And, uh, and that's something I think our district is really good at. 
Thank you. Would anyone else like to give an opinion? Come on now. All right, Mrs. Taylor, Ms. Rella. Um, yeah, uh, to add to Jason's, I think the social emotional is very important, but uh, you, it's very hard when kids fall behind in certain subject areas. So algebra one can't, students who went through algebra one might not be ready for algebra two, but algebra two still has to be taught. And so an acceleration model where um, teachers look at what are the core elements of the curriculum and what's most essential because we can't go back and reteach things from the other grade, but we need to give kids a foundation to go forward. So I think a lot of schools across the nation are looking at acceleration to find out what they need to teach so that kids are ready for that current grade level curriculum. Thank you. Anyone else? Ms. Harris. Thank you for the question. Um, I think that the most important thing that we could be doing is to identify uh, where those gaps in knowledge are, uh, because obviously our kids have suffered for 18 months or so while they uh, have dealt with this COVID pandemic. So I think that um, the first step would be to identify where we need to put dollars and funds. And then the second part um, is obviously trying to solve and find, come up with a solution. Um, I'm a big advocate of, of uh, support staff and uh, tutors and other types of support that students can make up this knowledge gap and, and get back on track with uh, their education. Okay, thank you. Okay, ready for question two. And this will go to um, Mr. Jacobs. <clears throat> what guidance would you as a policymaker give to the superintendent on use of the federal funding received as a result of the COVID relief package that goes to support schools? Thank you very much for the question. Uh, first and foremost, I'd like to thank uh, the League of Women Voters, WHCI and all the volunteers hoping this evening to make this opportunity possible. Um, I think that the board has already taken steps uh, you know, in this process. The gravitas of what is going on in schools is that our students are two years removed from a typical school year experience. Um, you know, the district has added uh, social workers, clinical interventionists and crisis interventionists uh, for the social, emotional and mental health of students as well as staff. Uh, the district has expanded the ESOL summer program to help students who need to make up credits or failed, our cl uh, failed classes. The increased hiring of paraprofessionals uh, and a full-time speech and language pathologist so that Morley and Northfelt uh, do not share a part-time employee, uh, better service our students who require these additional services. The ESSER funds over the next three years will be helpful uh, with areas of concern identified during the pandemic to address student deficits and struggles during these difficult times. Once elected, I hope to work with all these measures and to use the constant data being obtained by the schools uh, allowing us to assess the needs of our student population and pivot to aid them during these difficult times. Okay, thank you very much. Would someone else like to comment? Uh, Ms. Farquharson, Dr. Farquharson. Yes, thank you. I agree with what was shared. I think in addition to that, it's important to recognize that many of the challenges that were became more pronounced because of the pandemic, many of them were pre-existing to the pandemic. So I think having the mindset of being proactive and addressing those challenges also recognizes the, the means or the need rather to address those that were pre-existing to the pandemic and to try to implement longstanding uh, changes that are sustainable and it can improve changes for all. Uh, and certainly the funding will support that, but I think the mindset as well is important to make those changes moving forward. Thank you. Are there specific um, programs or, or um, curriculum that should be um, addressed using this money? Ms. Poland. I, I will also add in um, my thank you to the League and to West Hartford Community Interactive for hosting this event this evening. I'll add in, um, in addition to what has already been stated, we have developed a comprehensive approach to helping people get back on track, our students and our staff get back on track after what's been a really challenging 18 months. And one of the pieces that I'd like to bring forward is engagement in our schools, student activities, including sports and other clubs, 
are so important so that students begin to feel again that the school is their community. And that's why as a board, and this is something that I've been hoping to do for the last several years, we were able to eliminate activity fees and pay to play fees for the next couple of years using the federal funds to try to eliminate any barriers that students have to participating in any of the activities at school. We really want our kids to get back into the swing of things, to get back with their friends, get back into their hobbies. Physical activity is so important for their social emotional well-being as well, and as well for their learning. And those are some of the ways that we have tried to think comprehensively in addition to academic support and social emotional learning to try to get everybody back on track. Thank you. Okay, we'll move on. What are your priorities for educating West Hartford students? And this question goes to Dr. Thomas Farquharson. Thank you so much. And we'll echo the appreciation to the League of Women Voters and WHCI for hosting this event. And certainly Libby, thank you for your facilitation. I think what's important in terms of educating our youth, uh, it's important how we define that. And I think that certainly there is learning that takes place within the classroom. Certainly we have our, our subject matters. Certainly we have our social um, uh, related matters in terms of life outside of the classroom. But one of the pieces that I often speak about is wanting to recognize the value of learning taking place outside beyond rather the walls of the classroom. And I think for that, that's why it certainly is a holistic approach with the learning. We have the teachers who are in the classroom but certainly having the family engagement is very, very important. So the learning can continue within the home dwelling as well. One of the things we're very proud of with our school system is the effort and the importance that's put into place with the teachers and with the educational staff collaborating with the family, collaborating with the caregivers, however that may def be defined. It's not always a mom and a dad. It may be someone else who is raising and has a strong influence on that child. It's important that they are part of the learning process as well. But then it also extends even beyond that. Neighbors, community partners, persons who are working in the store, they also play a role in the learning of our young people. So I think when we recognize that holistic approach of the learning, that yes, we do have our school hours where it formally takes place, but it continues thereafter as well. And it's important that with that learning, that we're helping to give them the foundational skills where they also are not only excelling academically, but also socially and emotionally. It's important for our young people to be strong within themselves so that when they are faced with certain challenges, they're able to withstand that. And if we cannot look back to the past 18 months as a prime example of how we certainly have to support our young people in dealing with unforeseen challenges, we certainly have that opportunity now. And certainly our school system values that more now than ever. Thank you. Another opinion, another priority. Ms. Taylor and Nesarella. Uh, yeah, so um, I think what Lauren has said is very essential, but I think engagement is also something that we have to bring to our children. It's been a very tough year for many to stay engaged. And where we can bring in civic engagement, social, um, social justice, um, civic engagement, service learning, projects and opportunities where you blend subjects together, where a kid could write for a purpose, can research for a purpose, and then take action with purpose. And um, our world is not so siloed when we get out of school. We mix all the subjects together in our jobs. And I think when you give kids that opportunity to mix the subjects and not keep them so separate, you build uh, excitement about learning and you empower the kids to feel like they can make a difference. Thank you very much. Libby, I have a related question here that someone wrote in. How would you ensure that our students are well-rounded individuals ready for a modern work environment? Thank you. Um, and that, that kind of ties in with the question I was gonna to go to next, um, which is what needs to be done in technology so students will be well-prepared for the future. Um, Ms. Poulin, you're up next. Those two questions, that, that tie-in question there goes to you. Absolutely. So we actually, um, over the last couple of years, have developed a computer science curriculum from K through 12, which puts us ahead of a lot of school districts. Many school districts across the country have computer science offered in high school. But what we've done is develop a curriculum so that we can embed technology skills into all of our learning across every um, every grade in our district. That is really going to help our students learn how to integrate technology into their lives. 
We also have ensured that students have access to laptops uh, during the pandemic when we had remote learning. We also ensured that students had access to Wi-Fi as well, which a, not, a lot of people do not have, unfortunately, in their homes. So those are some of the ways that we're integrating technology. As far as making sure that they're well-rounded, we do offer a very broad curriculum. And what we're really trying to do is we're creating the next generation of leaders. We're creating the next citizens of the world. And so we need to make sure that students are well-rounded and do understand how the world works, are able to communicate with each other, uh, whether they agree or disagree with their peers and their teachers, to learn how to have conversations, have a love of learning and a curiosity for learning so that we are well set um, in this country with our next generation. Okay. Yeah, Ms. Ms. Harris, excuse me. <clears throat> All right, thank you. Um, you know, I think that West Hartford School Systems does an outstanding job. And I think that uh, we are actually one of the leaders in the state when it comes to technology. Uh, it's almost impossible to do anything today without having a ability to uh, work with technology. And I think that that has to be part of the curriculum and part of the school system. Um, so I think that we can always be investing into more and more technology for our students. And I also wanna say that I think we need to be investing in technology for our teachers as well, which I know we've done through the pandemic, but I think that um, as, as the technology emerges, uh, the teachers as well as the students need to be kept up to date with emerging technologies. Thank you. Thank you. To add, to, to add to Gail's point, um, not just the teachers, but support staff. And through the pandemic, we found that some of our staff that didn't have computers or computer access needed it to support their students that they saw in the building. And so um, technology needs to go to everyone who works within the school because in the pandemic, we found out that it was needed for everyone. Okay, thank you. Um, what I hear is everyone, uh, um, let me just ask another question here and then I'll get to you. Um, what I hear from everyone is that um, <clears throat> Uh, it's it's all focused on computer technology. What about other technology? Not every everyone needs to know how to use a computer, but not everyone is going to go into a uh, an information based career. Um, Mr. Jacobs, I'm sorry I missed it. And you can you finish you finish your thought, and then I want to go on to my thought there. Sure. I just wanted to add, you know, the EBV program and the EFC program that are helping those people in our community. Uh, that are not as fortunate or need the assistance to be able to keep up uh, and be a part of a 21st century uh, learner with the technology that's out there. Okay, and what about this? the second part? Is it, is it all information-based? I mean, what about um, hand skills, mechanical skills, cooking skills? I, I mean, a lot of the, a lot of the jobs out there now are, um, do not involve white-collar jobs. Yes, ab absolutely. Learning skills with your hands, there's a huge deficit. Uh, of labor out there that is skilled labor that is not technologically based. Uh, we need construction, we need people in the laboring fields. Uh, we all need those things uh, and we need people in those fields. Those are excellent fields uh, and there is a huge demand for it uh, and we need those people to help us. Thank you, anyone else? I just wanted to add that it, it doesn't always have to be a, a um, technology class that someone attends. As a school teacher, I expose kids to sewing machines, GPS units, they use power tools, they did video recording, they use pedometers. So there's a lot of different technology that kids can use that aren't computers and that get them more interested in what else is out there. Thank you very much. I'm just checking my, my messages here. Uh, Dr. Chang. All right, thank you. Yeah, um, I really appreciate the conversation on this. And I, and I do think, you know, the realm of digital uh, technology has, um, has a number of issues beyond just skill development. Um, you know, the, the, the way that we're networked together and the way that, um, the, um, that social media informs so much of um, of 
of our our cultural life and our our political life i think media literacy is really important um, with the high circulation of information um, and um, and the digital landscape in which all that occurs um, it's important for for students to be able to assess uh, uh, the the truth claims in in digital media and to be able to to search for their their own meaning out of that um, and so you know in that I think there's there's a couple you know key priorities around pedagogy which is to look at both identity um, agency and purpose and I think you know a curriculum that that attends to those dimensions of uh, of, of a student can get at a much kind of broader uh, uh, sense of the, the, the well-being of, of the whole student uh, that develops their sense of their place in the world, who they are, and um, and and then there are also their capacities to act in the world and why they want to change the world. What is it that motivates them? Those are all important questions that I think uh, our curriculum should be asking and uh, and preparing them for. Um, and, you know, with the regard to technology, I think the great uh, aspect of the schools is that we can give every student the access to, uh, to practicing with many different kinds of technology. So even if they become a mechanic, they know what computer programming is. And even a computer, programming, a computer programmer will know what it's like to be a mechanic. I think those are really important skills for everyone to have. Okay, thank you. Have we covered everybody? Everybody wanted to uh, chime in. Okay, um, let's let's go to COVID mitigation. Um, this is going to uh, Mrs. Taylor Nizarella. Um, your opinion on mask mandates, uh, COVID testing, um, all the safety measures that um, we have been putting up with uh, uh, quarantining, um, just in general, how are we handling COVID and do you agree? Um, through the pandemic, I worked full time in my school and we were masked the whole time. I saw kids enjoying themselves, working together. We followed all the safety protocols in the beginning, the six feet apart. Um, I think West Hartford has done a phenomenal job. Um, and I liked when there was some uh, restrictions about mask wearing in town and in businesses. Um, I feel like we came through fairly safe compared to some other states, and I was quite happy that I lived in West Hartford and in Connecticut. Um, right now, it's scary with the, the new um, variant and with our youngest kids not being vaccinated. I'm now in a school with pre-K to fifth grade students every day, um, and some kids had difficulty keeping the mask up. But in general, our three and four year olds are wearing their mask. Um, they're having fun, they're playing, they get the breaks outside. Um, and, you know, we, we are coping with it. Um, I do hope that more people get vaccinated. I think that will get us to a safer place. Um, and I was glad that my daughter was old enough to be vaccinated. Um, and I'm hoping that the booster is available as well. So, um, I'm very happy with how the mayor um, led us through this and the decisions that our governor made and happy to comply in my school building. Libby, I have some related questions here about not only masking, but mandating what people think about mandating vaccine or weekly testing of staff. <laughs> Good questions. Um, Ms. Taylor, can you continue or does somebody else want to chime in? Um, yeah, I, there's some staff that I work with and they're concerned because as of Monday, um, if they do not show a negative test, they have to go home until a negative test can be shown. And um, I feel, especially in my elementary school with all the kids and the staff that I work with, that it's important to um, ask people to either show that they don't have COVID or get the vaccine to protect themselves and others. So I am I'm for the mandated uh, testing for people who opt to not be vaccinated. Anyone else? Mr. Jacobs, we haven't heard from you in a while. How are you? The, you know, these mandates come from the governor and our town manager. 
uh, a supportive Ed member. It's our duty to uphold these mandates. However, we need to continually assess our situation so that we can hopefully revisit these decisions. You know, keeping our kids in school is our number one priority. And if wearing masks is what it takes, then that is what we need to do. Okay, thank you. <clears throat> we'll move on to another question. Um, we are on to uh, Ms. Ms. Harris. Um, what is your opinion on teaching the history of race relations in the United States to Connecticut students? Thank you for that question. Um, I think it's important that we teach all of US history to our students. Um, I think we have to teach the good, the bad, the ugly. Um, and I have, uh, hopefully all of our students are learning all of the history that they can. Obviously there's a limited amount of time in any class and we're not gonna be able to review every single event that occurred. Uh, but I do feel that um, there has to be a balanced and fair approach to US history, um, including all of the things that have happened uh, that are good and bad. And, um, and I, I think that you know, we should be teaching all aspects of US history to all of our students. Thank you. Another, another opinion, please. Ms. Thomas Farquharson. Yes, um, thank you for the question. And I appreciate hearing uh, uh, Dr. Harris's response. And I, I agree that certainly having a holistic uh, approach in educating our, our young people uh, regarding American history is certainly important. And that does certainly acknowledge the unfortunate reality that that has not always been the case. Um, and so with there being attention to having a broad, true, keeping it real perspective of American history and all that it entails and in all that it took the pain and the pleasure that it took to progress to where we are, I think only betters our young people. It's important for them to understand the past, for them to truly understand where we are now in the present. And that will make them even more uh, uh, prolific moving forward into the future. I think when we take away that opportunity to have a, a well-rounded approach in terms of the past, the present, the future, we're limiting their educational opportunities. And that's not what we stand for in West Hartford. So I very much think that acknowledging all aspects of American history and all of those persons who played an instrumental role in contributing to American history certainly is the way to inform our young people now and in the future. Thank you. Uh, Dr. Chang, I see you have your hand up. All right, thank you. Um, yeah, this is something I've spent my career uh, working on. And, you know, uh, but, but what, what I wanna share is why I value it. Um, you, you know, a lot of times when, when we think about US history, it gets divided into, into categories of like your history and my history. But really what I view uh, history of race relations is really a collective kind of history. This is about our past. Uh, and as, as my colleague uh, just said, you know, this is also about our future. Um, and so, you know, one of the things that happens when we teach a race relations work is that we come to a shared appreciation of struggles uh, and that there is also a kind of dignity in that that is shared. Um, and so, you know, not only sharing in, in those struggles, but also sharing in the joys and triumphs. You know, most closely, this was I'm reminded of of our Juneteenth celebration in town with the the, the creation of a beautiful mural on our library, um, and you know, just this wonderful celebration that understanding the struggle of African Americans makes that day and that mural so much more valuable and important for everyone. Uh, and so, you know, lastly, this is a really vital kind of uh, it, um, strategy for countering the rise in hate in our country. Uh, we need to replace stereotypes with lived experiences and history can do that. So this is a really important dimension of, you know, um, a violence prevention too. Thank you. Any other comments? Okay, um, we're going, we've, congratulations. Everybody has had a chance to answer one question. So we're going on the second round. Um, Dr. Chang, you're, you're still up. Um, let's talk about the infrastructure in town. We have a lot of aging buildings. Uh, should we fix them? Should we consolidate services? Um, there was a question that was brought up in previous debates about uh, consolidating the high schools. 
Um, yes, we, we should continue to improve our, our infrastructure. We have buildings of various different ages and the, uh, the repairs that we've made uh, in the last five or 10 years will last another, you know, uh, will last us a bit longer. COVID has shown us that we need to update the, the HVAC system. We've needed to, to work on the HVAC systems, which we've uh, developed a, a, a program to, uh, to address and update those uh, to ensure that the infrastructure is, it, you know, our buildings are safe um, as possible for learning and growing. And, you know, the, um, what we have is, you know, the infrastructure really, it, it, well, it is its own issue. It's about capacity. And our, um, our town is growing. And we will continue to have to need that capacity to teach the, 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 um, the children that are here. Uh, and so I, I think that um, we need to continue the maintenance of our buildings to maintain the capacity uh, to you know, continue the, the, the kind of uh, school system we have for current residents and future residents. Thank you. I see that Ms. Poland has her hand up. Yes, I wanna comment specifically on the question about consolidating the high schools. This is something that I do not support. Um, and I wanna state that outright. There are certain situations where bigger is better, where you do have economy of scale, but schools are not necessarily um, falling in that category. Both Hall and Conard are among the largest high schools already in the state. And the idea of combining them into one and putting 3000 students in one building is not something that I would ever be able to support. And let me give you a couple of reasons why. One is that we know that crowded uh, buildings are not what we're going for right now. We need to have a little bit more space than we would be able to offer. But also importantly, we understand the importance again of extracurricular activities, of participating in band, participating in choir, art, sports, et cetera. And actually when you have a combined high school, you have fewer opportunities for students to engage in varsity level sports, for example, or to be the first chair violin. It's just, uh, they're competing against so many more people. Right now we have two high achieving high schools, excellent high schools, which are always ranked among the best high schools in the country, never mind within Connecticut. To combine them into one would necessarily make them not as strong. It's not the kind of thing where adding them together makes it stronger. I believe putting them together would make them weaker. We need to keep them separate. Um, we can improve them both. We continue to look for ways to improve our school system, but consolidating the high schools is not something that I would be able to support. And I appreciate the question. Thank you. Um, I see that Mr. Jacobs has his hand up. Uh, thank you. So an issue that I'd like to take on regarding capital expenditures is amending or possibly rescinding uh, CSDE policy 52, 85-2, uh, I apologize. Uh, this policy lumps one-time expenditures like roof replacements into per-pupil per expenditures, and it determines the basic contribution amounts that districts must expend for each special education student uh, before the state begins to reimburse for the student's special education costs. Uh, clearly, we need to work towards a long-term sustainable plan for our future. Okay, thank you. More comment. Uh, I see Ms. Harris has her hand up. Hi, thank you. Um, I just wanted to echo what Deb said. I also am, want to go on record as not supporting consolidation of high schools. Um, I think that would not really be in the benefit of our community. Uh, we've had two high schools for a very long time here. And I think the community actually likes having two high schools where there's a rivalry between the two high schools, there's sporting events between the two high schools. I think also that we would have to seriously consider the cost of uh, taking two high schools and combining it into one, which would probably be exceedingly expensive. Um, and where those funds would come from is, is definitely questionable. Um, and again, I, I know this was said, but I just want to repeat, I think it also small, smaller schools offer more opportunity to students than larger schools. And I, I think that that's very important to our children and our students and our community. Thank you. Okay, next question goes to um, Mr. Jacobs. I believe that's correct. Um, 
as we were talking about infrastructure and combining things, um, what is your opinion of West Hartford class size guidelines? <coughs> Sorry, can you hear me now? I apologize. So I think that there's a lot of factors that actually uh, affect what goes on in the classroom. Sometimes there's mitigating factors outside of the classroom as well as inside the classroom, you know, especially at the elementary level, uh, having smaller class sizes for the students uh, is certainly helpful. Obviously, those class sizes sometimes grow as the students are older. Um, but, you know, closing the achievement gap, giving teachers the ability to work with each individual child, giving them the special attention that they need uh, is obviously uh, paramount. Uh, but also during these times, we've had to break down some of those classes, make them a little bit smaller, which has been helpful uh, during the pandemic. Okay, thank you. Uh, Ms. Harris, is your hand up or is that from? Oh, sorry, that was from before, but I, I can <laughs> actually. Can comment. <laughs> sorry. Go ahead and comment. Oh, okay. Um, you know, I think class size guidelines are pretty much mandated by the state. And I believe that in general in West Hartford, we've pretty much uh, often been under the state guidelines for um, class size. Um, so I think that in terms of what we're doing in the district, I think we're doing a good job. Um, as, well, as, as far as things like knowledge gap and class size, I, I think that knowledge gap can be a factor of class size, but it can also be a factor of many other things. Um, so, you know, as far as the class size, that we don't have all that much control over it because some of these things are mandated through the state. Okay, thank you. Um, Mrs. Taylor Nisarella. Um, yes, I, I think our guidelines for class size are reasonable. There are towns within the state of Connecticut that are higher. And with the COVID relief, um, we're able to have smaller class sizes as around 19 students in the elementary schools. But I wanted to make a point that class size is not as critical as balanced makeup of a class. And administrators that take into account teacher um, feedback about a class can make sure that the classes are fairly balanced. I've had a class of 18 be twice the work of a class of 27. So sometimes when teachers get their classes, it's not necessarily the numbers, but it's the amount of needs and challenges that are in that class. And many administrators will relook at or give support or find a way to help that teacher who just happened to get a bad mix of kids that make their class a lot harder than their other colleagues on the team. Thank you. More comments. Did we do uh, Ms. Uh, uh, Mrs. Thomas Farkasen? Yes, thank you. I am as well appreciate the question. And I think what's important with what we do in our school system is we recognize the importance of balancing quantity with quality. So quantity, certainly in terms of this teacher, uh, teacher student ratio, but as has been shared, it certainly is important at, uh, in being aware of the makeup within the classroom in terms of the engagement that's happening. And that's why it, it's so important to recognize the parallel process of learning, not only in terms of the students learning, but also the, the teachers as well. As we know, every Wednesday, every Wednesday is a half a day for professional development. And that is something that is very important to our district where we are not only, only focusing on empowering and educating the students, but also the teachers as well and help where they may want to progress or elevate further. So all of that collectively makes up the culture and the climate within the classroom. And it's important to be aware of all of those entities when looking at challenges, but also being able to recognize the progress and gains that have been made as well. Okay. Thank you. Um, Ms. Taylor Nazarelli, your hand's still up. Is that an old hand or is that a new hand? Old hand, I'll take it down. We could say something. Um, did we cover the, the knowledge gap? And we were talking, we've been dancing around um, um, problems with, with kids falling behind. We've, we've talked a little bit about class size and balance. Did, have we covered the knowledge gap? This is continuation of that same question. So let's continue on with the conversation. Somebody like to volunteer or I can call on someone. Uh, who shall I call on? That would be Ms. Poulin. Thank you, Libby. Um, to address uh, the achievement gap, it is unfortunate that we have an achievement gap which is based on race um, here in West Hartford. We'd like to think that 
we have erased that, but the data show us that unfortunately we have not. We are making progress. It's steady progress, but it's slow. And for me, it's too slow. And so here are some of the things that we need to do in order to fix that. We know one proven um, method of improving instruction and improving learning is through coaches. And that is where we hire coaches to help our teachers identify things that they're doing well and things that they can be doing better. We have had the opportunity to do, run a pilot program where we hired a math coach at one of the uh, schools in town. And those students in that classroom were able to improve their math scores over and above what other students did. And so we know right here in West Hartford how well the coaching program works. And so with some of the COVID money, we are hiring additional coaches for teachers. And that is one way that we're hoping to reduce again the achievement gap and bring up our students who are falling behind. There are so many different reasons why this gap exists. Um, things that happen outside of our schools are probably the biggest factor there. So again, uh, student engagement, family engagement, which I know my colleague uh, Jason mentioned earlier, is also so important in making sure that families know how to support their students and how to support the schools and we can work together in partnership to help our students all achieve. Thank you. Uh, Ms. Taylor Nizarella. Yeah, just to add to Deb's um, comment about the coaches, when um, the COVID funds are spent, it's not for full-time employees that can last on into the future. And so by West Hartford investing in coaches, they're bringing in people who can give tools and strategies and help the teachers that they can go forward with the, all that they learn the COVID funds um, can't bring in people that stay with the system. So I think that's a really wise choice to be bringing in people that will give tools and strategies that can go on after they have to leave. Thank you very much. Okay, that just generated another question, which we'll go back to um, Dr. Thomas Farkasin. Um, is staffing adequate? Um, has West Hartford um, had the same problems with hiring that other industries have had during this pandemic? Have people left? Um, do we have the talent? So thank you. Yes, we certainly have the talent, but the reality is we are faced with challenges that other districts have as well, not to the same degree yet. Saying that, we know that we certainly are actively hiring. If there are individuals who are um, interested in applying to the school system, please certainly do that. We are at a place where we're able to well um, maintain where we are at this time, but it's also important to be proactive in projecting what challenges we may have down the road. The reality is there are many other school districts in our neighboring towns and throughout the state that are having challenges when it comes to hiring staff or even keeping the staff that they have. We recently learned at our most recent board meeting that, that there are even some school districts that have challenges even maintaining teachers within the classroom. We're not at that point yet, but it still is important for us to be aware of that. As it relates to, we've certainly been hearing on the news challenges with uh, bus drivers. We're not at that point yet. However, it is something that we need to be mindful of. So I think we certainly recognize the situational stressor that the pandemic has put onto our district. Um, and fortunately, we are at a place where we're able to maintain, but we also have to be vigilant in making uh, changes, rather making decisions and choices that will help sustain where we are and hopefully okay. improve where we are moving forward as well. Many of our neighboring uh, communities are having challenges and we have to be empathic to that. And we also must recognize that we're vulnerable to that experience as well. Therefore, we have to be mindful in the steps that we take to maintain and improve where we are at this time. Thank you. Any other comments on that? No? Okay, um, can I get um, a time check, please? This is Cassie. Uh, Claire and Jason each have a little under two minutes left. Okay. Hey, this is, okay, this is David. Uh, Dr. Thomas Farkason has about two minutes left. And uh, also, uh, Deb Poland has about two minutes left. A little, yeah. Yep. Okay. And Carol. Um, Mr. Jacobs has four minutes, 45 seconds. And Ms. Harris, four minutes, 50 seconds. Okay. okay. We had some good time management here going so far. Okay, um, next question. Um, I kind of pulled um, 
Deb pulling out of order with that last question about um, the knowledge gap, I believe. So let's go to um, Mrs. Taylor Nazarella. Um, what's your opinion of making the free lunch program available to all students? Um, so this year, because of the COVID, I think it was a very smart move. Um, I have seen kids that often came to school hungry um, getting food. Not all families want to apply for free and reduced lunch. Sometimes it's a status issue. Sometimes parents don't always know about the program. And I do think that it's been very beneficial. Um, my daughter enjoys it. We used to pay for lunch. Um, we've taken advantage of it right now. I do think it should go back after the pandemic's over, but still families are struggling. Um, there are people who are still losing their jobs, do not have work. And I think we need to make sure that all kids have their tummies filled and for all that they're doing, dealing with and the social emotional needs, hunger is not something that any of them should struggle with right now. So I'm a proponent of it. I was glad the federal government um, mandated it. And if we have the funds, I would like it to continue. Thank you. Anybody else? Okay, everybody's in agreement. Um, next question will go to um, Ms. Harris. Um, do you have any ideas or, or concerns that haven't been addressed here? Um, well, I think we've covered a lot of different topics. Um, one, one thing that I am concerned about, and I, I can, it goes beyond the school system, I think it goes into the town in general, is uh, the issues of safety in our town and uh, some of the issues that revolve around safety in our schools. Um, I think we've seen an incredible increase in criminal activity in town. And we've also seen in the neighboring towns that some of that criminal activity is expanding into the school systems. Um, in West Hartford, for the most part, I think we've been fairly good till now, um, but I do am concerned with the level of uh, criminal activity in town that this ultimately is going to start affecting our schools. And I think um, the it's very hard for students to learn in an environment where they're not going to feel safe or where there's an issue of safety. So I do think that that is something that um, should be addressed as a uh, with the board and with obviously with the town council as well. Um, how do we keep our schools safe and how do we make sure that all of our students feel safe in school? Because it's very hard to learn if you are worried about your physical or your mental or emotional health or safety in school. So I'd like to see that addressed in town and certainly by the board. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Ms. Pullen, I see you have your hand up. Yes, I'd like to respond to that. I want to make sure that parents in town feel comfortable and safe sending their students to our schools. <clears throat> it is our highest priority to take care of your children. When you put them on the bus or you drop them off at our school buildings, you need to feel secure that they're going to be safe. And we, as our highest priority, will keep them safe. I don't want anyone to be nervous over uh, what my colleague Gail has just indicated. We are doing what we can to keep your children safe the way we always have, whether it's through a pandemic or no pandemic when this is over. We will do everything to keep your children safe, to create an environment that nurtures learning and provides an opportunity for children to feel like they are welcome and that they can take the time to uh, be comfortable and learn to their highest ability. Okay, thank you. Any other comments? Mr. Jacobs, oops, and then Dr. Chang. Uh, so one of the topics that we haven't addressed is uh, conservation. I think that the educating of children on the green initiative, focusing on STEM and STEAM curriculum holistically to prepare us to have 21st century learners uh, is truly critical uh, because students learn critical thinking skills, uh, which help them understand our world's ecological future. I think it fosters a sense of pride and ownership in our community 
uh, and for our world. It teaches kids to be responsible and to make informed decisions for our planet. Okay, thank you. Dr. Chang, you had a comment. Yeah, thank you. Um, uh, I wanted to add another dimension to the safety issue, one of which is uh, the issue of uh, safe routes to school. So, you know, there's a lot of students who walk to school. Uh, we have a, an excellent neighborhood school system. Um, and, you know, with the change in, um, in traffic patterns and how traffic is assessed, it's something that I think is worth another look uh, to, 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 uh, to understand the distribution of crossing guards and to make sure that they are effectively placed. Um, you know, that, you know, as, as we've, uh, we've seen, there have been, you know, some, um, some traffic accidents in town uh, that have raised, you know, some, some issues around where the crossing guards are. Uh, so, you know, that's something that I would like to see uh, addressed. And, you know, when we do that, we make school routes uh, more accessible to, to all neighborhoods. And, uh, and we can actually serve more students when, when we do that. Um, you know, the, uh, the pride of, of walking yourself to school uh, and to be able to, to have those, uh, those, those regular patterns in your neighborhood is such an important part of living in West Hartford. Um, and that's something I would like to see improved. Thank you. Any other comments? Okay, um, I think this will be the last question um, and it's a question that pops up um, cyclically. Um, I know it, it came up when my children were in school. Um, start times, are our children getting enough sleep? Um, let's see, we're going back to the beginning and that's, doc, that's Dr. Chang again. All right, uh, thank you. Uh, I don't have much time left, but I will say that the science around uh, school start times is pretty clear uh, that high schoolers need to uh, start later um, and, uh, and, and not earlier. So, you know, I know that involves a lot of uh, transformation or there's a you know, big debate around, uh, you know, uh, on teacher's time, uh, uh, bus schedule management. This is a big issue. That, um, that I think can, um, can and should be looked at from many different angles. And I need to do some more learning about the district's history with the conversation, uh, but that's something I'm, I'm committed to, thanks. Okay, thank you. Any other comments? So we wanna show a hand, start times are good? No, I won't do that to you. Okay, um, I think, oh, Dr. Harris, uh, Mrs. Harris. Yeah, I just wanted to also state that um, the science around sleep for high school students uh, really does show that students will learn better and have better outcomes when they get more sleep. And I think that this issue, I know it's been looked at on the board and um, I know it's been discussed, but I, I think it should be um, assessed again and possibly looked at um, so that our students in high school can have the best outcomes. Um, there's definitely evidence showing that students in the high school years will do better when they get more sleep in the morning. Thank you. Okay, thank you. All right, let's, um, we're gonna close up the question section um, and we'll start on our closing arguments. And um, Ms. Harris, you're, you're already up. So you, you are gonna start, you were the last respondent, you are the first closer. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you to the League of Women Voters for facilitating this discussion here today. And thank you to my fellow candidates for your comments and insights. And thank you to the voters of West Hartford. I've lived in West Hartford for almost the last 50 years. I attended the West Hartford Public Schools and I've raised my four children in this town. They have all benefited from the wonderful educational opportunities in our town. Now that they are older, I've been privileged to see how well they have all succeeded in their chosen careers. I've practiced medicine in town and in the surrounding towns for the last 20 years. The drive and ambition to become a physician came from the educational institutions that I was fortunate enough to attend here locally. I am passionate about education as I believe it is the stepping stone to success in life. The West Hartford Public Schools are the crown jewel and one of the best assets in our town. Many people move to this town primarily for the wonderful school system we have. We have historically given our children tremendous opportunities through the educational system, 
and we need to ensure that this trend continues into the future. The COVID pandemic has been a challenge for all of us and learning has been lost. Our children have faced online learning and hybrid learning, which has affected our students' education. I would like to work to ensure that our students are prepared for the future. And I believe it can be done, particularly if we focus on the basics of education. If I am fortunate enough to be elected, I will work hard to keep our schools on a path of excellence. I will make sure that every child receives the best education possible here in West Hartford. I ask for your vote and your support on November 2nd. Thank you very much. Thank you. Okay, um, Ms. Taylor Nazarella. Thank you to the League of Women Voters and all you do to make sure the public is informed. Your service to all elections is invaluable. I need to also to acknowledge the WHCI staff and volunteers for being behind the power of public television. And thank you to all those watching the debates and taking time to learn about the candidates. You're taking your right as a voter seriously. My name is Claire Taylor Nazarella, and I'm asking for your vote for the West Hartford Board of Education. I taught 16 years in West Hartford, and I taught my students about the structure of government and how bills are made. More importantly, they learned how change is made and went before the Board of Ed, the Town Council, and even legislators to propose solutions. West Hartford was an incredible town to start my teaching career. I represented our town and state in Washington, D.C., and traveling globally to Japan and Brazil with teachers from each state, I became aware of the high caliber of our district. As a school teacher for 23 years, I have direct experience with curriculum, special education, technology in the classroom, and initiatives in diversity and inclusion. My mission is to do what is best for the students of West Hartford. I want to help all parents advocate for their children and become active partners in the education process. I believe in the importance of early learning and will advocate for increasing pre-K opportunities. West Hartford can lead and has led in many initiatives. Our national recognition doesn't surprise me after many years of being on both sides of the fence. Throughout the pandemic, I worked with champion teachers who juggled technology and still connected with each one of our students. West Hartford schools navigated the past year and a half with honesty and grace. I'm excited to be running with the Democrats United for West Hartford Schools. Vote row A on November 2nd. Thank you. Thank you very much. Okay, uh, Deb Poulin, please. It has truly been an honor serving West Hartford on the Board of Education for the past four years. I have served on the Policy Committee as a financial examiner as vice chair, and I am currently the chair. I've also had the opportunity to hear from so many residents and engage in conversations with people from many different backgrounds and many different perspectives. My time on the board, combined with my professional experience working in nonprofits and at the state legislature, and my perspective as a mom of two kids who went to Aiken, King Philip, and Hall High School, will continue to benefit students and families in our town in the years ahead. We have seen, particularly over the past 18 months, how important it is to have the right people making decisions about our schools in order to provide a safe, nurturing environment that fosters a love of learning. We need people who will listen to others, who think creatively, and who are not afraid to make difficult choices. We also need steady leadership to steer our schools through these difficult times. <clears throat> I'm asking you to vote for me for re-election, and I think you'll find that all of the Democrats running for the Board of Education and for Town Council are the people that you want helping to set the direction for West Hartford now and moving forward. Fulfilling our responsibility to our children and families in the present leads to a stronger West Hartford in the future. I too want to thank the League of Women Voters and WHCI for coordinating and hosting this debate my fellow candidates for participating, and all of you for watching and taking this opportunity to learn more about each of the candidates for the Board of Education. Thank you in advance for your support, and please remember to vote row A for the Democratic team on November 2nd. Thank you very much. Moving on, um, Dr. Thomas Farkason. 
Yes, thank you so much. And once again, thank you to the League of Women Voters for this opportunity. Thank you for WHCI for hosting us. Libby, thank you for facilitating this engagement. My colleagues here, thank you, thank you, thank you. And importantly, those that are watching or those that may watch this at a later time, thank you. And I wanna give a huge thank you to our young people, to our children. We are here all asking for support to be on the Board of Education. And it has been an honor to serve on the Board of Education for the past four years and the past two years as vice chair. Serving on the board is more than a title. It is a purpose. It is a purpose that's helping to educate, contributing to the education of our young people. And as we certainly know, our young people of today are going to be our leaders for tomorrow. Therefore, as we work to educate them through the policies that we put in place, through the teacher and support that we support, through the ways that we encourage our young people at home and in the community, we know that we are paving waves for them as they move ahead. As we know, our school motto is clear paths, bright future, no limits. And it's important when we look at the word clear, we're talking about that as a verb. That means ways that we are actively and assertively moving towards supporting our young people as they move forward. Because the foundational years that we have with them now are so important because again, they're going to be our leaders moving forward into the future. I have been a proud resident of West Hartford for 20 years. It's my home. It's the home of my husband. It's the home of my two daughters who are West Hartford Public School students. So this is more than something to do on a voluntary basis. This is a, a personal commitment. This is something where I am invested, whether being formally on the board or being a resident of this town. And collectively, all of us play that role. And even if your children are no longer in the school system, you are part of this community. It takes a village to raise a child and we need all hands on deck in doing so. And especially because of the past 18 months that we have experienced, it's been unprecedented. We have a lot of work to do. We've come far, but we certainly have a ways to go. Looking for your support on November the 2nd, Lorna thomas Farkason for the Board of Education. Thank you for your time and your attention. Thank you very much. Moving on, we have um, Mr. Jacobs. Hi, uh, I appreciate everyone watching this evening and all that will view these debates from now till election day. Thank you again to the League of Women Voters WHCI and all volunteers helping this evening to make this opportunity possible. I'm here before you in an effort to voice the opinion and concerns of many people in our community that don't fit in or identify 100% in our two political parties approaches. In yesterday's debate, GOP took the opportunity to comment on a fellow candidate's personal family decision about what schools their children attend. Dr. Harris, can you explain why your party feels personal choice will affect the candidate's performance? This is just another example of why political mudslinging has no place on the Board of Education or on the Town Council. Your party's attack on these families is unfounded, improper, and erroneous. As I've lived here and walked these streets for weeks, it is abundantly clear that there is a large population of people that are frustrated with the politics and behaviors that make them feel shut out of the process and who are angry that their input doesn't seem to matter. I'm here to tell you that it does. I'm here to tell you that I will be a megaphone for that voice. I'm not here saying that you will get everything you want or lie and say that everything is possible. I will tell you that trust is built on telling people the truth, not telling them what they want to hear. This, I can promise you, is my philosophy and my approach to working with everyone. There doesn't have to be a political side to education. The only side is being on the side of children and the community we serve. My job will be to connect the will of the community to the education of its children. Thank you for allowing me the opportunity to work with all of you. And please vote for Ross Jacobs on Tuesday, November 2nd, along with the other members of the A Connecticut Party. Vote Row D. Thank you. Okay, um, one more to go. We have um, Dr. Chang. All right, can you hear me? Yes. Okay, thank you. Um, I'm asking for your vote to continue serving on the West Hartford Board of Education. Uh, I parent my three children uh, with my partner, Julie, uh, who's the former poet laureate of West Hartford. Uh, our children attend Charter Oak and Sedgwick. Uh, we moved to West Hartford 10 years ago because of the schools and we wanted to raise our family in this community. In the summer of 2020, I answered the call to fill a vacant seat on the board at the height of the first surge of the pandemic. And I really thank uh, my uh, colleagues on the board for, uh, for nominating me and, and for, uh, for welcoming me, welcoming me into uh, this role. And now I'm seeking your vote. 
um, as a university professor of history and Asian American studies and an academic unit administrator, I was honored to join the board to help the district respond to the needs of students and families during the pandemic and guide the district's efforts to address equity and anti-racism. My leadership at UConn and in the state more broadly in this area was recognized by the governor as I serve on uh, as a committee co-chair on the state's hate crimes advisory council. Over the last year, we've made significant policy progress and continue to lead the state in academic outcomes. The pandemic has also shown us that there is a lot of work to do to address disparities in experience and outcomes, and I'm committed to that work. I've used my experience on the board over the last year to work with districts across the state to listen to students, families, and teachers about how to improve the education of the next generation of problem solvers here in West Hartford. When you make your decision to vote this fall, I ask you to consider my experience as an educator, my track record of advocacy, and my proven leadership in policy programs and oversight. Thank you very much. Vote row A, please. Thank you very much. Thank you to all the candidates. Thank you to the league members who assisted and thank you to WHCI. We hope this debate assists you, the voting public, when you go to the polls on November 2nd. Um, we had uh, this Board of Ed debate and four uh, town council uh, debates and they will all be available on WHCT TV, WHCI during the month of October and on their YouTube channel, go to whctv.org. Get to know your candidates and please exercise your right to vote. Also go to the league's new website, vote www.vote411.org to uh, learn more about your candidates. Uh, there, there will be online bios as well as uh, answers to questions that they have answered um, online there. You can also find out if you're registered and if you're not, uh, you can, it can assist you to register online. And you can also check the uh, Connecticut Secretary of State website and town registrar sites also have options. Go to myvote.ct.gov slash lookup. I want to thank everybody again and we'll say good night. Good night. Thank you. Good night.